Come All on, right, man. everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast. As always, presented by our good friends over at Scentlock. I am wearing my favorite pants on earth, the Verse Pant from Blocker Outdoors. Austin, as I was, um, well, we'll just say it, as I was bending over the computer to get ready, he said, dude, those are nice pants. He said, dude, this is an awkward time to be telling me that, but they're from Blocker. Guys, the Verse Pant from Blocker Outdoors, absolutely my favorite release that maybe Blocker's ever come out with. I was anticipating these for a long time before they came out. It's all I wear now. Go check them out, the Verse Pant from Blocker Outdoors. I'm with my boy Austin Ledbetter, and we were talking about November 9th, a day in the woods that both him and I will remember for a long time. We both found success. We both punched tags, and they're both good stories. So stay right here tuned in to hear this tale of two bucks. Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast. Where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. Guys, if you're a traditional archer and you have not checked out Three Rivers Archery, what are you waiting for three rivers archery is your one-stop shop for all things traditional archery they have the largest in stock selection of of traditional archery equipment anywhere same day shipping very 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 knowledgeable listen i use three rivers all the time if i've got a question on tuning if i've got a question on broadheads if i've got a question on brace height or anything like that I use Three Rivers for everything. They know the products because they use the products. Three Rivers Archery is by far the gold standard when it comes to traditional archery. So guys, if you're just getting into traditional archery, I would encourage you to use Three Rivers as a resource for knowledge and understanding and growing and learning and as a place to get all those products that you're going to be needing as you take this journey. Austin Ledbetter, my friend, my homie. Austin, a.k.a. Chrome Dome, a.k.a. Slick Nickel, a.k.a. Big Buck Killer, a.k.a. Greatest Mustache in Kansas. What's up, dude? Oh, man, I'm still living on that uh, that great high that kind of quickly <laughs> comes down. You like two days is what I was telling my buddy. I got two days of just really enjoying that I got that that mission accomplished and then, over. and then you remember like, Oh man, I'm off. Like I can't. Yeah. Well, that's why you buy an Oklahoma tag <laughs> or Missouri yeah. or Arkansas or Iowa or wherever. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd thought about doing that, but soon you're going to be in the same place that I am now. Cause your boy's getting old enough, but, uh, I got a 13 year old that I'm going to try to, uh, be an amateur guide and outfitter for. So, yeah. uh, yeah, now he's the next mission to get him his tag punched. But yeah, I'm kind of sad. Now he Happy. actually shot his first one last year, right? Uh, no, he shot his first one well, when he first was seven. One with a bow, right? Uh, shot with a crossbow last year, didn't he? No, he's gotten a couple with a crossbow, but last year actually was <laughs> was the actual opposite. No, he uh, last year was his first year of what I would call being inducted into being a real hunter because. I do a lot of the work for him. Like I yeah. said, I amateur outfit for him, but last year he, he had to watch a lot of bucks run by and using a crossbow. They're just not easy to manipulate for someone his age. So we had to watch one of those hot does run by us on the wrong side and a whole string of bucks that he would have loved to have flung an arrow at just. And then when he did finally get an opportunity after seeing all these deer that he just couldn't make it happen on, uh, he had a, a bad hit on one. So he got the full spectrum after a long season of hunting of, of all the ups and downs of what deer hunting is. So last year, it meant a lot to me. Austin is my cousin. Uh, so Silas is what I consider a nephew, although he'd be a cousin. Uh, I consider him a nephew and, uh, he wanted to come show me his buck. And that <laughs> meant a lot to me. He pulled up to the house and I ran out of there and it was in the bed of the truck. Big deer big old body deer nice deer dude so uh, i was awfully proud of him last year but i uh i went to call you 
And just to tell you, I, hey, dude, I got a buck down, dude. And you're like, hey, me too. <laughs> and uh, so November 9th, we actually also had a good friend of ours, a uh, fellow friend, shoot an absolute stud. Um, never found it. His story ended a little differently, but never found it. Um, and I was hoping, the, right when you told me, you're like, yeah, I kill one too. I'm like, yeah, we're doing a podcast for sure. Yeah. And then Aaron was like, dude, I just shot a stud, but I don't, I don't I'm not comfortable with the hit. Uh, I don't have a lot of hope and uh, I was awfully hoping I'm like, man, that'd be so cool to three, three of us be sitting here. I'll kill it here on the same day, but uh, it didn't happen. So um, did you have history with the deer that you shot or was it just like, <laughs> this is the buck that came in? So the, the place that I shot this deer, um, I, I call it quick trip. And the only reason I do is because I don't, um, I, I'm a 40 hour week guy. I don't, I don't have great, hunting spots but this place just seems to be a place that that deer just kind of come through they don't live there right uh, a couple of does do but other than that it's just mainly during rut i just kind of go there and see what comes by but uh this year there was a couple of deer that i had had early enough in the season that i thought well hey you know i'd love to have those two deer but i've learned through years of doing this that uh, i was actually i joked with a lot of people this year that i never shoot bucks i have on camera so if i see a big one on camera i just assume well not gonna get that one yeah so this deer uh actually Put him up here we, th- we have both of our heads to show off while we talk yeah so this is uh not gonna stay up like that i don't know how to sit it up there that it won't here i'll just hold it while you talk okay You've got yeah. to look at it. I haven't got to look at it. Yeah, I, I've gotten so uh, used to this happening that I don't name him or anything like that. Um, I lovingly joked that uh, when I found him, I, I called him Lieutenant Dan because I thought he had three legs. But um, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> but no, uh, I didn't realize until he was already dropped off at the processor and I was back home and, and kind of cleaning everything up. Uh, I started looking through some photos and realized, man, this uh, this deer I was after looks a lot like him and i started seeing the characteristics and uh yeah he's got some character for sure yeah he was uh one of the two mature deer that i that i had had on camera so yeah that but no name to him um but he he's one of those two that i've been following a lot and i was really glad because that's one of the biggest things i utilize cameras for is it helps me to get uh get used to seeing a deer and telling if it's mature on there or not because man that buck fever when a buck comes in and, uh, it'll about make you shoot <laughs> sometimes anything. And that, that wasn't the case for this deer at all, though. That, that hunt, if you want me to go ahead and tell you what happened was kind of ironic that, uh, I didn't think I was going to shoot anything that night. I, I didn't bring a sled. I didn't bring my game card. I've got all these things <laughs> I bought to try and, uh, Give me one of those books. Um, but yeah, all the things that I brought, none of it was there at all. So I was just trying to fit in a Thursday afternoon hunt because um, it's what worked with uh, my brother-in-law picking my kids up for me and yeah. my, my wife picking them up. So just uh, I ran out, got in the woods, and I was actually so thinking I wasn't going to do it that I had a, a lecture for, for one of the college classes I'm taking that was that night. And uh, I was sending pictures to people while listening to my lecture. Sorry, if you guys were in my uh, critical thinking class and you saw me in camouflage, that's there was a couple of guys that wished me good luck when they saw my face, but, um, yeah, I, I watched see that during COVID when all college was online and there was a zoom class of like 40 kids. And one of them was cleaning a Turkey. <laughs> the professor said, are you cleaning a Turkey? And he said, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay. Just keeps teaching. <laughs> well, and I would have been more honest with my class, but my instructor is actually out of Wichita state here close by. So I didn't want uh, it to be, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to get, uh, caught doing something i shouldn't be doing i didn't i didn't know if that was allowed but a nice three-year-old came in while i was watching that lecture and i'm sending pictures to people like man it's hard to pass on a nice deer like this but i could tell he was really young and as the evening went on some more young deer noticeably young deer came in um and as i was watching him and and getting ready like it was getting within the last probably five ten minutes of of legal shooting light i just heard the sound that i really don't know that I've ever gotten to hear a deer make that loud before, but so off to the left, I was like, which one of these little deer is about to fight another little deer? Uh, and all of a sudden he just kind of bold legged, just that, that nice slow walk with his ears pinned back. And as soon as I saw 
his rack. I was like, well, I can't tell, you know, I didn't see a whole lot there. And then, uh, cause his, against his body, his antlers don't look very big. Uh, so he <laughs> kept walking towards the other deer. And when he got close to one of the young bucks and before the young buck kind of skedaddled, I thought, well, okay, yeah, big body. And then there's enough light. I could see the inside of his leg and his tarsals look huge and they're dripping down his leg. So I knew immediately like, yeah, this is a mature deer. Uh, I didn't know how many points or anything like that. I, so I drew back, uh, he kept kind of moving away. And as I drew, he stopped at a nice quartering way shot. And I just, I always tell people aim on quartering way for that off shoulder and I've got the setup for it. So shot, you know, went straight through that leg bone, you know, cut it like butter. And, uh, it was, you know, cause you're out in the woods, like Kansas is usually incredibly windy. So you don't get to hear much. Yeah. In fact, if this podcast was outside, you wouldn't be able to hear us at all. But that night it was dead calm. So I heard him run out to about 40 yards and then the woods just went quiet. And I thought, Oh, that's not good. And then after about three seconds, I heard him fall and he never moved from there. So uh, <clears throat> the real learning moment for me in this whole story was after that, you know, I knew he was down. Um, I could hear him expire and I go call my brother-in-law to say, Hey, you know, uh, we always talk a lot when we're going on our hunts, you know, he's down, uh, he's right here and he offers to come get him. And I was like, no, 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 no. It'll be 20, 30 minutes before you get here. I got this. I'll drag him out and I'll load him. So then I go get the truck, pull it up. And I've only got about a hundred yards to drag this thing out. But again, I didn't think he was that big of an antlers. You know, I, I just thought the body made the antlers look small. And so they, the body must be average size, you know, and, uh, man, I, I never felt so out of shape and small <laughs> in my life. It was about every 10, 15 feet of just, you know, grabbing his antlers and backpedaling and trying to use good posture. So I don't hurt my back. And then once I got into the truck, that was where I'd never talk to like an animal that was down or God or the woods so much like, you know, why are you so fat? You know, like, like, Lord, what have I done? Like, it, like, oh man, it was a, it was a beautifully struggleful evening. If that's a word. No, but, that's what you, but that's what you had told me. You're like, this is what I've been wanting for a long time. Yeah. I've a lot of people, um, my brother-in-law ruined it for me. Everybody wants like a 200 inch deer, but when you see a new guy down one with his second, <laughs> second deer ever, yeah. it kind of changes the way you look at it. And if you I don't like, know what he's referencing. His brother-in-law, his second year ever hunting still in high school, shoots a 241 inch whitetail. Yep. Just uh, unreal. He went from a forky to the biggest buck I've ever, ever seen. seen in person. Yeah. Ever at all. And anyway, um, and in the coolest way, like it's not, I mean, uh, it's not like a, like a, a farm deer where everything looks melted and weird. It is just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to find a place to go after that. And also you learn a lot about the, you know, the way hunting goes after that. But no, I, for a long time, I just wanted a huge old, you know, some people call it a warrior, but I just wanted a big fat old deer. Like you got I, him. Yeah. Now, now I don't think I'd want another one. What I'd love he, to get one bigger, but I'm not going to, I'm going to ask for more help. What yeah. did he weigh? So we weighed him at 263, which again, for one guy to drag, well, that was all I could do. Um, I hear they get even bigger than that, but um, it, we weigh a lot of deer at my house. Like I love having, I have a cleaning station there. So anybody that wants to bring their stuff over and do anything, I've got all the the knives and all the, the, the preg check gloves that go up to your shoulder you know, stuff to spray them out and, and all that. And one of the things we do is weigh them. Um, cause a long time ago we found it was a lot easier to help with aging, you know, seems like younger deer seem to weigh quite a bit less. And one of the things that helps, you know, it's four five, six, seven years old is just the body mass. But yeah. Um, I know that they can, they can get, you know, over 300 pounds. It's very uncommon to see, but I guess that'll be my next goal. But, uh, even still, I had no idea that, that he was going to weigh that much. I just knew he was mature. And that's kind of my, my barrier. As long as I know that they're mature, that's then I'm going to send an arrow and send a prayer. <laughs> now that is, uh, the first deer I ever shot first buck I ever shot after moving to Kansas weighed 241 pounds. Wow. And I was just like, dude, like 
I was almost ruined at that point. Like, cause I grew up hunting deer in Arkansas where a big buck's going to weigh 140 pounds, 150 yeah. pounds. And, uh, then you shoot one that weighs a hundred more pounds than that. And you're like, dude, this is a horse. Like I remember sending a picture to my dad and he was like, holy crap, forget the antlers. Look at that horse. And, um, yeah, that's kind of like, that's one of the fun parts about being in the Midwest for sure. Like, but that body can also be deceiving. Like I said, cleaning the deer. Uh, I learned this from other buddies who have shot, you know, big bodied animals that like, you're like, well, Hey, that's not a bad buck. Good, solid, good, solid rack. But when the head comes off and you see it standing alone, it's, it's just a whole different thing. The body can really be misleading on, on when you're trying to field judge them. But yeah, that's why there's a whole lot of other stuff. Like I said, the tarsals, the gut, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> that belly is, yeah. is one of the biggest things I look at. Yeah. One time, uh, one of our other buddies, one of your cousins, Garrett, um, he had a deer he'd been hunting and he shows me this deer in a field photo and he's, or in a, in a, uh, uh, trail camera photo. And he says, what do you think this deer scores? And I said, probably 140. And, uh, he goes, yeah, that's what we thought too. And then I killed him and he weighed 300 and something, 306 or something. It's like that deer scored 175. Yeah. Like it just, it literally just shrinks, like shrinks some, the antlers down tremendously and same thing happened last year with me with that deer i shot in oklahoma because it was a tank of a deer i think like 250 and uh i honestly thought i'm like these antlers are tiny which they really were uh they, it wasn't a big animal probably 110 inches but um just a big old eight-year-old buck and uh that we want to kill off the ranch there at liberty ranch and so i i shot this deer thinking like man those antlers you could tell this is a huge mature deer because he just he just postured up everybody else. And you're just like, God, it's a big old deer. Um, but yeah, same deal. Like you think like, and he's nothing special up top. And then you kind of separate away from the body and you're like, okay, he's pretty good. Like he's decent, you know? Um, yeah, he actually, um, is the second biggest deer I ever shot I, after I put tape to him, which I actually, this is a, I don't really ever hardly measure <laughs> Because I, again, I'm, I'm happy if I get into that one fifties, like one forties to one fifties, as long as it's mature. But, um, I was just kind of curious, like Dude, I'm oh. the king of one twenties. <laughs> well, that's the crazy thing too. Talking about vantage points and stuff. I shot this one. Then you sent me a picture of yours and you had your hand on it. And just a way that the, the photo you sent me, I was like, Oh man, like, it did not do any justice and felt, in fact, I felt bad sending you pictures of mine because I was like, like, I didn't know what you had shot. But then when I see it, when you posted online, like, but by the way, dude, for being such a, a media wizard, that was the worst picture to send somebody. Cause that thing is three times bigger than what I thought it was. And <laughs> something that's, so I also do those Euro mounts, but something else, I spend a lot of time having to hold the main beams. That thing has so much of those little tiny Nerling. cactus. Yeah. That, that it's, it was eating up my little rubber gloves that I try to wear. Like, so that is one like thing a chainsaw i sent people that picture uh mainly because i was waiting on somebody to come out and take pictures yeah um and so i sent people that picture because the only person out there was tucker yeah and tucker couldn't hold his head up uh so i just like tried to get some sort of photo just to send to people just while i was sitting there waiting and uh it was funny dude i don't know if i told you this but the words that came out of tucker's mouth was some of the wisest words I've ever heard. And if you know Tucker, dude's a butthead. Like, dude is <laughs> straight up. Talking about your son. Yeah. Just a, a turd. <laughs> like, doesn't ever say anything like that you'd be like, oh, dude, you're a smart little kid. Um, <laughs> He's in the room, by the way. This yeah, is not. It's, it's not a secret. Yeah, he's I come home yesterday. <laughs> I come home yesterday and he said, Dad, I'm starting a fire in the backyard. I'm like, do whatever you want, dude. And I go out there and he had one of the giant blow up pumpkins from Halloween and he just had a lighter underneath it, just lighting the pumpkin. And I'm like, what an idiot. he's five. Um, it might be bad parenting. You can question me later, I guess. Um, but we FaceTime my dad. My dad's like, is he big? And I'm like, not really. I mean, just a, a good old, good average deer. And my dad said, dude, you only get one tag in Kansas. When are you going to start shooting big ones? <laughs> <laughs> my real answer is like when the big ones show up before the one twenties. Cause I don't, I mean, I don't pass up a one twenty. Uh, yeah. And that's where I, just like you said, like, uh, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, me personally, I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm that kind of hunter. Like I, I like catching fish that I can eat. I like shooting the first thing that is old enough I that like comes to in. I kill stuff, dude. Yeah, I'm just... and I am not good at eating tags at the end of the year. So I've done my share of that, and I just made up my mind that like uh, I would rather I would rather just know I'm getting mature deer that's good for the the population of the area. It's 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 a mature animal, um, but I am not good at letting stuff walk uh, to get something bigger. Man, it's just so it's too much self control for me. I well, let me go back to what Tucker said. Tucker said. Yeah, pop, pop, but it's a buck. <laughs> and like, I was just like, dude, that there's so much in that little statement right there. Cause so many people like, I'll never forget. Um, one time I made the excuse of like, I know it's not, I got, I hate that. I know it's not big, but here's the buck I shot. And I did that one year. And this was like, right when I was trying to like start doing what I do for a living and, Somebody commented and they said, well, man, just so you know, uh, I, I would love to even see a deer like that, much less shoot it. And I was just like, you know what? I'm never going to say that again because there are people out there that would die to have that deer. Like that would, that they've been hunting so hard. They've only seen fork and horns and does. And so I never want to say that because there are people out there that would give a lifetime to shoot a 125. Um, but anyways, and I'm like, there's so much truth in that. Like, yeah, pop, pop, but it's a big old buck. Like, it, it's it's a nice Kansas, fat-bodied, I don't know what mine weighed, but, um, which crazy story, I don't have any history with mine either. Yeah, um, let's look at it. But this is, so, if you follow me on social media, you already know, um, but Tucker was with me when I shot this buck. Um, and Tucker, my five-year-old, for a five-year-old, hunted really hard uh started taking them out last year and um we never saw anything last year uh no, no bucks we saw does and stuff and and uh but we can never get does close enough to even shoot one of those with tucker um because it is hard to be in a ground blind with a five-year-old and have a deer come within 20 yards um especially you mentioned on a quiet night i was literally texting people and i'm like uh, i was texting aaron and i'm like dude the wind just died down so much here that I like Tucker eating chocolate is like the loudest thing ever. And I'm like, dude, every time Tucker talks, like it's just, there's no wind to cover it. There's still wood in his antlers. Um, cause I heard him making a rub. Um, and I'm like, dude, I just don't, I don't have a lot of hope for tonight with how much it's died down. Like there will be no wind cover for us. Um, as far as noise goes, but I don't have any history with this buck. However, I have a lot of history with this antler genetics. So if you see really good right side, just perfectly typical on the right side. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side. And on the right side, he's got this dinky little antler. Um, just a crab claw main beam with a G2. Um, I have so much history with this antler genetics on my property this year. I've got probably four deer running around that look just like this most of them small uh most of them like itty bitty uh like i'm 60 inches but they look exactly like this and so i'm like man that's weird i was telling somebody we're also gonna grant and i'm like dude it's weird because i have so many deer so many young deer with this genetics but i've never seen the lead of that genetics if you will like the the predecessor of that genetics and he's like yeah that is kind of weird like usually you know you'll see that big one that has that. And then you'll start seeing little ones. And, uh, anyways, I didn't give much thought to it. So me and Tucker were hunting over a decoy. I put out, uh, a Dave Smith decoy, which we've been talking a lot about. Um, which by the way, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but that is the best decoy you could ever buy. Um, I will definitely be sponsored by Dave Smith. This. It looks like a stinking taxidermist buck is what it looks like. It's a, it's honestly, it's, it's almost too good for, for, a definitely not a rifle season decoy but uh man that's one of those ones where if it's too long of an all-day sit you might you know snooze a little you know reach for your bow if you yeah. come to um which by the way tucker named ours bob and so we have bob the decoy nice. um so we're hunting over a dave smith decoy and and where we're at we're kind of in the belly of this the the field makes a belly um so we're in the belly of that field 
And at the top of the field, you can just, there's a ridge line where you can just, every sunset's behind, it's beautiful. But we're sitting there and we're sitting there. And what was special about this hunt is, like I said, Tucker's been hunting pretty hard. And I could tell he was almost on the verge of like giving up. Like he was almost on the verge of like quitting, you know? Because it, the first part of the season, he's like, yes, we get to go hunting. Like, yes, I want to go hunting. Let's go hunting, dad. When can we, can we leave now? And I'm like, well, Tucker, it's noon. So we don't want to sit for nine hours. So no. Um, but this time he was like, why don't you just go and I'll stay here. And I'm like, buddy, well, first off tonight, that's not an option because your mom's not here and you have to go. Um, but I could just tell I was almost losing him. And, uh, even tonight, like we, or even that night we climbed in the blinds, like dad, are we going to be here for a long time tonight? And I'm like, no, we only, it's two hours. We're going to have a two hour set, two hours before sunset. I'm like, nope, just a couple hours, bud. So he tucks in, he's eating chocolate and playing on the blind, playing on the phone or whatever. And I see this buck come out across that ridge line. And I never, ever, ever, if they're up there, they're on, a, they're on another path. I, I know that spot. I hunt that spot too. Uh, just can't possibly do it with Tucker. Um, cause it's a high up tree stand. And anyways, they never come down in the belly if they're up there. Um, and so I'm like, Tucker, dude, there's a buck up there. And he looks and he says, dad, do you think we can kill it? And I'm like, well, we're going to give it a go. I'm sure going to try. And so I start grunting at him and he turns. And this is like, I was trying to tell people like, this is what you want to see on TV. Like when you log onto the outdoor channel to watch a hunting show, this hunt, the way this unfolded is what you want to watch. He turns, locks eyes with that decoy from 150 yards away immediately bows up and comes down that field just i'm talking when he turns his neck is all wrinkled up and the hair is all standing up on him i actually showed chrissy later on the the trail camera photo of him coming in like why he's coming in. i'm like look that was seconds before he died she's like what's wrong with his neck why is his neck so wrinkly i'm like that's the good thing and so he comes in on a string and uh the whole time i honestly didn't think it was going to happen because I'm like, Tucker, here he comes to don't move. And of course he hears that he moves. Um, and I'm like, Tucker, you got to stop, buddy. And this, this one is like 50 yards away. And Tucker keeps popping up out of the window to try to see him where he's at. I'm like, Tucker, please don't move, dude. And um, anyways, he's coming down the field edge and he turns and he's going to come literally comes uh, around the decoy. So he can come in on the decoy's weak side and shot him at 24 yards and Tucker just squ starts squealing, squalling. We just shot a buck. We just shot a buck. I'm crying. Like seeing my son's reaction literally brings tears to my eyes. And I'm like, we did it, dude. We, I can't believe this. Can't believe we shot a buck. He's like, we just shot a buck. So we FaceTime my dad. Uh, I, I, Tucker's just yelling at my dad. Pop, pop. We shot a buck. We shot a buck. We're FaceTiming Chrissy. Chrissy's like, no, you did. Like, no way. And I'm like. It was just unreal. And it was it was a good experience for Tucker because he got to see the deer run off. Um, the way this property, like I said, it's a U, so there's tree lines on both sides. So he sees it run through the tree line. We see it come out the other side of the trees in the field over there. And I'm like, Bub, do you still see it? He's like, Yeah, I see it. Oh, he's wobbling. Those were those were his words. Oh, dad, he's wobbling. And uh I said, Do you still see him? He said, No, I lost him. Cause he kind of walked behind some trees and he never came out the other side. So I knew what happened. Um, and I'm like, Oh man, well, I guess we'll have to go look for him, you know? So we walk out there and again, if you follow me on social media, you've seen this video and it's literally is amazing. Tucker finds zero and he's like, there's blood everywhere. This is a good sign. <laughs> and so we're walking through the woods. I didn't video this part cause I just wanted to be with my son, but we're walking through the woods and I'm like, Oh Tucker, here's blood. Oh Tucker, there's blood. And, uh, the whole time he, he's walking through the woods, he's talking to himself. He's going, no freaking way. No freaking way. Did we just shoot a buck? No way. We just shot a buck. Ah, I just shot a buck. We just shot a buck. So we come through the tree line and I'm, I immediately see him out in the field. I'm like, there he is, bud. And he's like, where at? They only went 50 yards. We didn't know it's like track him far. And I'm like, he's right there, buddy. And he sees him and he just takes off sprinting and he's just going, dude, dude. And he's just running, like, dude. And he gets up there and there's a, massive pile of blood so you could tell he was on this side and then you know had one last flip or jerk and he just goes oh don't step over there <laughs> and so we walk up and oh man it was just a special moment with my son but 
even if what's crazy is I told people like even if Tucker wasn't there, like this was just a picture perfect decoy hunt. Like you have a decoy out, you grunt, he responds, he comes in, like you heard him making a rub. Like it was just it was an incredible hunt, even if Tucker wasn't there, but Tucker being there, like I would not trade that for a hundred lifetimes. Like yeah. it, it was just it was special. And uh, you know, I, I told Tucker I was explaining to him just, you know, the importance of of respecting life and uh, so again that was the first time he got to be there for it and so yeah this one's special man for sure guys there's one fabric that if you're not wearing you absolutely should be it's a magic fabric it changes everything about the way you layer everything about the way you dress everything about the way you hunt and that is merino wool i couldn't even begin to tell you all of the benefits of merino wool and i'm gonna miss some for sure but guys, whether it's summer or whether it's winter, uh, this is going to keep you cool in the in the summer. It's moisture wicking. It's going to pull the moisture away from your body, but it's also going to hold your heat in the winter. It is antimicrobial. It doesn't smell. It doesn't hold scent like other fabrics does. So if you're out on a five-day hunt, you don't have access to a washer, this is not going to hold your scent. It's not going to to get stinky and nasty. Um, it's also uh, quick drying. Um, you can hang this up in your tent. You can hang it up uh, on a clothesline. It's going to dry really quick. But the coolest part about Merino, in my opinion, is that when it gets wet, it still maintains it still maintains its warmth properties. So if there's a light rain or a snow and this gets wet, it's still going to keep me warm. There's no itch. There's it's it's non allergenic. It's an amazing an amazing fabric. Minus thirty three. I stumbled upon minus 33 by accident i was on backcountry.com and they were having a blowout sale i needed some new merino for a hunt that was coming up and so i i dove in i bought it and when i got it it was the softest best merino i have ever felt in my entire life i've not worn anything but minus 33 socks for everyday life whether i'm hunting hiking or just you know out for the day i haven't worn anything but minus 33 socks in over a year and a half Every single day I'm wearing their underwear. Every single time I'm out hunting, whether it's 100 or whether it's 5, I'm wearing some sort of beanie to cover up my chrome dome and to keep that covered up and warm uh, or cool Whether if it's in the summer. But also um, that UV protectant. I like to wear it in the summer. Um, guys, minus 33 does Merino, in my opinion, better than anybody else does it. Go check out minus 33 for all your Merino wool. And if you haven't ever tried Merino, Guys, you are missing out. It will change the way you layer. It will change the way you hunt. Go check out Merino Wool and go check out Minus 33. Yeah, and I think I told you exactly what uh, I told my brother-in-law this year when I was trying to get him to buy a decoy. Is Man, that is my favorite way in the oh world gosh. to shoot a deer. Is, is watching them come in over a decoy. Um, that's how I got my deer last year. And I did a lot of hunting over decoy this year to try to get that again. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, uh, I wish, I wish I could have gotten this dude off of a decoy again, but it's just watching them come in and seeing them do what they do, um, you know, on their own, you know, using their own, uh, aggression, their own emotions to, to get them to come into you. That's just the watching the show, you know, they put on a whole performance for you. Now I did one thing I bought this year, was one of those predator decoys and what i wanted to do which obviously it happened before i got to do it because they're you know i couldn't do it with tucker but what i had planned on doing was setting up the decoy out in the field edge and then me just sitting off into the tree line a little bit without a blind or anything and just holding up the doe decoy the doe head on my bow you know um and shooting one from the ground with the bow head with the the doe head on my bow and uh, obviously it didn't happen that way, but, um, that is my next, like want to do it. Cause it looks so much fun hunt. So, uh, one of the things I'll tell you, I've got a few of the heads up decoys and, uh, the one thing I'll, um, not that I'm anybody to give advice, but from being out in Western Kansas with the whitetail and the mule deer, um, I highly <laughs> promote the, Again, if you want to sponsor me, heads up. I'm okay with it. I've actually met the owner of the company. He personally yeah, you like ran into him on the mountain or something, didn't you? No, he. Uh, I had a part that uh, wasn't fitting right on my bow, and he said, "Hey, you're on your way out to Western Kansas." And he said, "What highway are you taking?" He met. He himself drove and met me to give me this part. He said, "Hey, I don't know what's going on with this one, but here's here's a new one." 
I mean, I thought you like ran into him on the like in a restaurant. Oh, on the that was country. a that was a di- <laughs> that was a different one. That was a that guy invented a turkey decoy. Oh, uh, which also works really well. But no, the owner of Heads Up, uh, talk about customer service. You know, doing it yourself. But no, what I was going to say about the Heads Up decoys is I've had really uh, good luck with uh, both the doe and the buck, but I've had a lot more luck. If you have a doe decoy, if there's a doe with that buck, she's going to come in and want to kind of check you and stomp at you. But I've noticed with the buck, uh, the buck decoys, the the doe will stay back and you'll get to watch that buck come in and want to challenge you. In fact, my uncle um, saw how good mine worked when I was out there. He hunts he hunts with me when I'm out there and he bought one to put on his crossbow and he, he, uh, he said he shot a buck in self-defense because it, it was coming in at five yards and he says, well, it's either him or me. Yeah. But yeah, that that uh, heads up buck decoy is a blast. Uh, I haven't gotten the, I haven't gotten to do a do a white tail that I've gotten to take with one yet. But I'm I'm working on it. Yeah, I, uh, which I mine's not the heads up um, brand; it's the Predator brand. Yeah, yeah. Um, which similar concept. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, he, the owner and founder of Predator, is actually the host of Hoyt's podcast. A uh, good friend of mine, Danny Ferris. Shout out to Danny. Um, Danny Ferris, if you haven't listened to Hoyt's podcast, it's a it, Danny does a great job, so I would definitely tune into that. Uh, go listen to like episode, uh, it was like 180 or something. I was on it, so that was a good, really good episode. Um, you know, I want to take a second, uh, and I do want to jump into like uh, decoy tactics for just a second, but you guys don't know this. Um, you've probably never heard me talk about this, but Austin is one of the reasons I host a podcast. Um, one of my biggest kind of supporters in the beginning and one of my biggest, um, givers of advice. Austin just was a, your job at the time, at least you, you know, always had headphones in, always listening to podcasts. And so, um, when I was approached by the last company that this podcast was started under, you know, I was like, Austin, you know, think, think I might do this podcast and just give me a lot of advice on, you know, how you think they should be handled and, and, the biggest advice I gave you, he didn't take, and probably for a good reason. I told him he should start a comedy podcast <laughs> because I said, dude, you've got one of the best sense of humors of anybody I know. So I was like, dude, if you just told I, nothing but jokes. I thought you were going to crack a joke on my hair or something. No, it matches. We, we have the same hair, dude. This is oh. not a requirement in Kansas for those of you that aren't here. It's, it's just, you know, God chose my hairdo for me. So. <laughs> my hairline made a beeline for my behind. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm, I, uh, I've been really, um, really impressed with how far, uh, the podcast has come. And obviously as, as you do it more, uh, it gets better, but also seeing how many people, you know, through comments and stuff on your social media, it's, it's helping a lot of people. Like we're, we're just about to get to, to decoy tactics and, um, the same stuff that I was saying, and I'm going to say, uh, I tell my own brother-in-law he's hunted yeah. for a few years, killed the biggest deer I've ever seen, but he's still learning. I mean, he yeah. still comes to he's you for green, advice. Yeah. yeah. Like he's and every, every guy that'll listen to this, that's honest, whether you're new or been doing it for, you know, 30 years, you're always in November when you're not seeing your target buck, you're questioning yourself. Yes. Like you're, you're wanting affirmations on and like, you make mistakes when you question yourself, oh, man. And the only worst one. And I, yeah, uh, and I'll pray for you if you've been this guy this year. Is if you shot a buck and not found it, that's a pain that I wouldn't put on anybody, especially in November. Uh, the closer it gets to you know the Christmas, it seems like the more heartbreak it is. To where some guys will just put their bow up and say, "I'm done." Uh, one of the guys I talked to over over the weekend, a mutual friend of ours, he 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 had a big buck and almost just didn't want to hunt no more. If he hadn't been out on a trip with his dad. And his dad making him do it. He said, I was just going to put it up. Like it breaks your heart, man. And guys, we don't yeah. want to talk about it, but, but man, these kind of podcasts like this, where you get to hear it happens to other people. Oh my gosh. Um, well, yeah. last year and I, you know, I've talked about it. Well, this year I hit it though with my recurve, never found it. Yeah. Um, last year I, dude, I hunted for 10 days in Idaho, shot a bear with my recurve, never found it. Yeah. Um, that, that bear though, that uh, I still believe it was a good hit a little bit high tad high, but definitely still a good hit. Uh, I believe that bear's dead, which is what makes it harder. Yeah. Like there's a difference. Like the doe that I shot with my recurve this year, I know she's alive and well. Mm-hmm. Um, I see her on my cameras and there's just a little cut. It was a picture perfect backstrap shot. But um, but the bear, like me and the outfitter both, like that bear is dead. Like 
looking at photos, looking at, you know, pictures of the shot and uh, like still frames of when the arrow hit and just the blood on the arrow, the blood in the woods like that bear is dead. We just couldn't find it. And uh, that is even more heartbreaking. Yeah. And I, one of the best, uh, you know, true born in the blood killer, one of the you know guys that I work with, guys that are just, you know, uh, people that I would go ask questions to when that happens, they're asking you, Hey, where do you think I hit this? Yeah. What should I do? Uh, all it's, you know, rain's coming in or, you know, uh, sending you pictures and ask like that. That's where I was going to say a podcast like this, you know, for guys who, have, uh, don't feel bad. Everybody has had that happen. In fact, yeah. I told my brother-in-law while we were cleaning this buck, he said, man, that was a great shot for quartering away like that. I said, man, when it comes to a bow, I don't feel like any of them are my prowess as a shooter or as a hunter, because the second that I touched that release, uh, I could have used a, a new glove to stay warm and torque the bow. Uh, the, the deer could jump the string, which happens to millions of people every year. Um, there's just all these things that can happen. A little limb that I didn't know it was there because it was close to dark. I mean, with everything that can go on, I feel like, uh, you know, getting a chance on a mature buck is, is as much, you know, um, you know, just the luck of the draw as it is anything else. You know, I just yeah pray I never have that be my turn to backstrap one again and not find it. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's why I tell people all the time, like, you worry about what you can control. Like, there's yeah. so many things downrange that I can't control. But you worry about executing a shot to the best of your abilities and don't don't try to guess what the animal's going to do. Like, the idea of shooting low knowing it's going to duck is stupid. Yeah. Like, I've literally heard people say, yeah, I hold right under his belly. That way he ducks right into it. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing ever because what if he doesn't duck, you hit low. Um. And you don't, you know, you miss the deer, like shoot for the heart. If he ducks, you hit the lungs. Like, well, and there's other, you know, um, being as this is like a educational kind of podcast, like, uh, I, I can tell you a lot of times it's in Kansas. So I hear if you go down South, those, those deer are wider, a little different or in other States, but in Kansas, uh, I always try to make my shot when the head's up. Uh, watch some videos on, on their reactionary speed, you know, using their head to leverage their body down. So I like this buck, his head was, you know, above his spine. So I, was, I always try to this. try to make sure the head's up. I have a new theory. I don't know if I've shared it on this podcast before or not. I think I, I think I have, but I have a new theory. We always wait for the front leg to come forward, opening up vitals more. Mm -hmm. I think that also helps with reaction time too. I think a deer can't duck as fast if his front legs are, you know, spread out. Okay. Whereas if he's standing there, you know, he can spring forward more. But whereas if this is happening, he can't, you know, he's got to almost pull that leg back before he ducks. Yeah, having one leg locked. Yeah. I, um, and again, there's never been a study done on that. But I just, I was just thinking about that the other day. Like if, you know, if I want to jump, I don't spread my feet to jump. I load myself up and jump. So I thought, well, if a deer has one leg forward, then it can't duck as fast. I mean, yeah, you would think. So not only does that help open the vitals up, but it also gives you better chance that if his head's up and his legs forward, he can't duck as fast. We need to do a Mythbusters podcast, but we're going to have some science there that is way outside of my pay grade. I don't but believe I, in science. <laughs> so I'll say this. I believe in Jesus. <laughs> the hard part. Don't take that wrong. Don't take yeah. Guys, I'm not saying that. Okay, you get what I mean. Yeah. I believe in science, but I also believe in Jesus. Um, I was going to quote Nacho Libre, but I'll leave that one there. Because you only believe in science? Um, no, but. So I, I will say this too on, on the jumpiness thing. Um, I don't know how to test that leg thing, but I'll say this 100%. For states where baiting is legal, for states where uh, people hunt the same tree stand. You know, I, I know Michigan or other states, they've got tiny parcels. Where, where guys will hunt the same trail year after year um, from hunting over corn or, or a bait pile or whatever it may be. Um, I have always seen deer seem to be on edge and on alert a lot more. You know, if you've ever seen a squirrel bark, um, the deer, when they come into a spot where there's been, you know, a lot of hunting, which is typically what bait pile is there for is people going over and doing it there. But I've watched does just be five feet away by the time a squirrel is done with its first bark. I mean, it's just, they come in tuned up because you know, they know this is where coyotes come to look for them. This is where people come to look for them. Yeah. Um, but I, they just, it's like they tiptoe in, 
they're walking circles. You know, I, at that same stand I shot this deer out of, there's this one old doe who will do always do a hundred yard circle to try to see if I'm there. Killer. I would love to, but a hundred yards is a, is a bit much. <clears throat> Not with a rifle. I got like one up. good eye. Yeah. But no, I, I, I do believe there's a lot of things that, that I try to look for, for a keyed up deer, but at the same token, man, when you make that choice that it's a deer you're going to shoot a lot of the things in your mind just shut off yeah like it just goes into autopilot like when i got my bear nick said it just looked like you were just in in a groove you know but like i've been doing it since i was 12 you draw back you know set your anchor you know open your hand put your pin on like i didn't have time to think which also that's another one dude like watching that buck come in from 150 yards i guarantee you you were 10 times more shaking than i was oh, well i don't get shaky <laughs> like i really don't i i usually can control my composure really well and really truly like you know we talked about body size uh overwhelming a deer's antlers especially when he's not big antlered i honestly thought this was one of the younger ones with those genetics I mean, you can shoot him anyway because of the antler, because of the body size compared to antlers, mm-hmm. I truly thought, oh, that's one of those uh, jankety antlered bucks. Um, and I just thought he was one of the like the seventy inch bucks. But Tucker was so excited, and I was so excited, and I was shaking more of like, don't let me screw this up in front of my son. <laughs> Not because I want to look tough in front of my son, but like, God, you've given me a chance here to harvest a deer with my son. Like, let me make good on this. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, dude, I was, I'm like, oh. and part of it was trying to keep Tucker quiet, and like thinking the deer was going to bust out because of Tucker. And like, yeah, I hadn't been shaking up like that in a long time. And that's, that's what I was meaning is I, I mean, I, I've never gotten to shoot a deer in front of my son, I don't think, but, uh, man, wait until he gets to be the one with a bow in his hand, dude, you're going to. If you, if you cried at that one, you're going to, you're going to need a whole box of them tissues. Cause that, that first deer that you get to be there for him, when he gets to tell you, he got the deer when he's, you know, saying, you know, daddy, can we go get it now? Daddy? Like, yeah, that is such a, I, my son's first deer was with a rifle when he was seven. And it's that same kind of story with him. He's, he'd spent, you know, three straight days of just, you know, grinding and grinding. And then when that one opportunity came, seeing it all pay off for him. Like he, uh, I'd been having to tell him kind of like you did, you know, with Tucker, I was like, Hey bud, when you get one, it'll all pay off. So there's the first thing out of his mouth. You were right. It all yeah. paid off. Yeah. But man, it's the, it's, it's one of the craziest bonding moments, you know, that me and him have had, you know, it sticks, it sticks in his mind. I still use it to this day. If he's wanting to be lazy on the couch, you know, I'll remind him, Hey man, you remember when this happened? You remember when we good things happen in the woods, not on the couch, man. Yeah. No, that's, I, I remember the first time I shot a deer and thinking like, dad, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, and we're talking South Arkansas. We're talking yeah. like five minutes from the Louisiana border. Like a big deer weighs 120 pounds. And I shot a small deer. I shot a, a yearling buck. Golden retriever. Uh, it's probably 50 pounds, like legit, <laughs> probably 50 pounds. But my dad is freaking out. And I'm like, I like, I didn't get. Now I do, you know, as a dad, you're like, oh man, now I get what dad was, was going through. But, um, so yeah, of course, pop pop was on FaceTime with us for the retrieval of it. And, um, just one of the greatest experiences of our lives. And, um, again, wouldn't trade it for a hundred lifetimes. So, yeah, I'm happy for you, man. That's awesome. And that was one of the reasons I normally do my own Euro mounts, but I bury mine. Uh, I have for the last, the last four deer I've shot have all been buried, but that takes seven months. And Tucker was like, dad, can we get it on my wall? Can I put it on my wall? And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a while, bud. And uh, so I'm just like, maybe I should just get this. Maybe I should just get the Euro done. Um, And so I call you. I'm like, hey, who do you have to do your Euros? And you're like, I do. And I'm like, deal. So we shot these on Thursday and uh, I got it back on Sunday. So, yeah, it's a pretty good turnaround. Well, I like you. So, you know. um, Yeah. Why? (laughs) No, I. uh, I also, I'm such a observer and appreciator of deer. I I like, I mean, I even brought, brought your jaw bones back in here. I just like looking at all the comparisons and all the the details of a deer. I appreciate them. I really do. I, I was talking to my son about that the other day. He was mentioning how 
uh, oh, you know, uh, I can't do this because they, they, you know, someone else he was talking about, you know, they would, they'd get their feelings hurt because they love deer. And I said, dude, I, I spend so much time, you know, studying deer. Like, I don't know anybody that could love deer more than I do. I, I put special supplements out for the does and fawn, you know, to help with their fawn. Yeah. And, and during that season, like, I, I, I pay attention to them more than any, most anybody else, you know, sort of a biologist. Like I, I love the animals and I love getting to kind of respect them in a way when I get to make them look all pretty to go on your dinner table. By the way, don't stop supplementing. Hey, my deer's already done processed. I, I just got a text. So did I. Right before we came here. Carpool. Roll out. Um. By the way, don't stop supplementing deer feed just because, well, I'm done hunting, so I don't need to put out feed no more. <laughs> Now we're going into, you know, if, when you get into December, January, February, those bitter cold months, that's when your deer needs supplementation the most. They're beat up. They need recovered from a, a hard rut. Food sources are limited. They're, they're, they're pregnant. So they need more food now than ever. Do not stop supplementing your deer just because season's over. It's, it's there's a difference in a bait pile so you can shoot them and trying to help your deer herd. So keep supplementations out, keep giving your deer what they need. Um, I did a full podcast with uh, buck bourbon, um, which is my favorite supplements um, on deer supplementation on when they need what on when we should be putting out what. So if, if that's something that interests you, go back and find that episode with buck bourbon uh, because deer needs supplementation now more than ever. Um, when it comes to a decoy, what are your tips for putting out a decoy, how to position them, um, how to place them? What so, do you do? Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I've been using the same decoy for quite a few years, so I'm really interested to hear more about yours because that, uh, it's almost too realistic, that uh, DSD. But um, I'd always been told, put it out there 20, 25 yards quartering facing toward you and then last year i was having so many issues with my decoy blowing over i thought well hopefully the quartering thing what works. decoy do you run oh it's it's called a scar decoy i think it was an old flambeau one but i yeah. like it because the the antlers are just the right size to where um it's not intimidating i've i've had uh oh, who was i with i was hunting with somebody uh from our old church a long time ago and they had a big, huge, it was like a 150s, 160s class buck. And it seemed like every buck that would kind of look at it would never come within 30 yards of it. But this one was, uh, it's it's like a little six point rack. But um, if I angle the antlers out just right, it, it looks kind of kind of intimidating. But yeah, last year I, I put it, um, I think like right at 10 yards or something, like quartering away. And just something about a buck, uh from what I was reading and watching, um, it did ex every buck did the exact same thing. They want to walk. The bigger the buck, the closer it would get, but it would just want to walk right in front of its face. So that's that's what I've found. Uh, and also, I don't like walking further out there to make it face me because then I'm leaving ground scent. I, I, I yeah. just as little as possible. Uh, you know, I, I I try to leave as little on the ground to make that buck get get weirded out by me. In fact, two years ago with that same decoy. I, uh, <laughs> I messed up a little bit. I, I was getting in a tree road where I was going to sit and I put a ghillie suit on and I put the buck in a spot and I didn't range it. And he was, uh, he was about 20 yards quartering towards me. Well, like I said, he wants to walk in front of the face of that deer. Like they're going to walk in the face. And this is a really big seven point. I mean, he had a, he had a nice, um, uh, set of four points on one side and a big three coming out the other side that was kind of injured, but I didn't think about with the decoy at 20 yards, like he still walked like seven yards in front of my face. So the second I tried to raise up my bow, uh, he saw me. And again, another mistake I made was I didn't continue my draw. <laughs> so I started to raise it. And as soon as I went like this, he started to bolt. So I let down. Well, then he stopped about five yards past my decoy. So I could have had a 25, 30 yard shot. He just stood there. If I'd have been at full draw, he stood broadside and kept stomping at my decoy. Like, Hey buddy, you don't see that guy there. So, <laughs> okay, we got to get out of here, dude. Yeah. Come on, Larry, let's go. <laughs> this ain't about me and you no more. This is about him. <laughs> I got no beef with you. We got to get out of here. There's enough dose for all of us. No, but if I, I learned a lot from that and I feel like every season I'm learning something new. 
Uh, I'm learning about Knox this year on micro diameter arrows and how finicky those can be. Like uh, those one six six Knox are not designed for a beaten. But um, no, that that year I learned. You know, as soon as you commit to drawing on a deer, finish your draw. Like never stop on it because that's a situation where could have had an awesome experience right there with that buck and uh just didn't connect because i didn't yeah. finish it no I've, I've come to experience the same thing put them out there uh 16 17 yards quartering towards you a little bit um because like you said they're either going to come at it head on so you have a perfect quartering away shot or they're going to walk in like you said in front of the head so you have a quartering away shot still or they're going to come around the side so they can, you know, get an advantage on that buck in a fight or whatever. So then you then you have a broadside shot. Yeah. So either way, but so many, like I used to see the mistake of like, well, I want to put it quartering away from me that way. Well, then the deer's quartering to you pretty hard and you don't get a shot on the buck. Yeah. And I guess everything I think of, and I, I've taught my son this since I was little, I always would ask him, what's a deer's number one weapon? And he would always, you know, tap his nose because that's, so everything I think of was scent. So when I put it, you know, slightly quartering away, that means that I that oh cross, you put it quartering away from you yeah so the buck is actually facing in that situation the buck was right here um, quartering away from me and every one of the bucks I had three bucks come in that night they all did the exact same the perfect broadside you know walking right in front of that deer's face and again that means that I set everything up for the wind kind of trying to blow in my chest or knowing where it's blowing but if I put the deer the the decoy out there further well now I've got a you know, no matter how much I spray on that, that decoy, I know that I'm going to have some kind of scent on there. It's just not, I don't, I don't ever assume I can overcome a deer's nose. I've gotten past that, that prideful thing of thinking by bagging all my clothes, by spraying down the decoy. Yeah. I, I don't mean, even wash my clothes anymore. Yeah. I, there was one time I sprayed my doe decoy with so much of that scent locker stuff. She looked albino, but, <laughs> but yeah, I always do everything I can for scent and that, that situation last year when my decoy kept blowing over, I was thinking, well, Hey, you know, I'll just move it closer to me, um, put it facing away, you know, and then putting it at 10 yards, whether the buck decides to walk at 12, 20, 30, however far to inspect my decoy, you know, it, it works out a lot better. I'm not forcing a buck to walk into a funnel like between us. Yeah. But, Which is why I like, it's kind of why I've landed on 16, 17, 18 yards. Yeah. Because if they're past the decoy, you can still shoot them. Or if they try to come downwind of the decoy to get to scent check that decoy, then they're not in your lap, you know, then they're still at 10, 15 yards. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a professional to vet out decoy locations, but no, that's just what I've been seeing this year. That I, I would love to sense. have somebody on who just is a decoy master. Uh, oh, which yeah. Melissa Bachman actually is probably the best I know of with running decoys. Um, she, and I'd love to hear experiences where that quartering away closer decoy where that's not worked out well. Like I've yet to have yeah. an experience to to yet you know where where it's really burned me. But you know I've only been doing it that way for the last couple of years. So. Yeah, I, I think with decoys the the biggest thing is like no matter how you set it up, the deer can come in from any way. Yeah, I mean had that deer come from you know not had that deer come not from the east had he come from the West and he would have been behind the buck. So he would have done something different. You know, he wouldn't, uh, he would have came in a different way and, you know, I would have shot him differently, but so whether he's quartering to you or quartering away from you, like just depending on where that buck comes from and what kind of mood he's in, you can do all sorts of different things. You know, he might yeah. just be wanting to scent check that buck. He might be wanting to fight that buck. He might be wanting to, you know, if you're on a field edge, you might be wanting to go see if he has a doe bedded down in the, in the thicket behind you, you you know, there's so many different things that can happen. So with a decoy, just be open to try new things, be open to experiment by setting him different distances, different, you know, positions to you to see how the bucks respond to it. Uh, because decoying maybe more so than anything else, maybe calling, but, but decoying is about doing it and seeing how the deer respond. Oh yeah. And that's part of the excitement. You know, it's not a, fixed point of corn on the ground where you know this buck's going to come in put his head right here um it's it's the dynamic part of watching you know every step he takes and and seeing how he blades and corners his body you saw it when it, whenever yours comes in they'll walk straight at you but they'll hold their head sideways to try to look big and tough to this buck man i, I love watching i love the like thinking about what this deer is trying to do in his head to look as big as he possibly yeah. can it's 
it's funny. It's, <laughs> and it's a, it's a cool show that you don't get to see any other way. If you've never decoyed deer right now, this episode's coming out on the, <laughs> on the 15th right now is a great time. My favorite, oh, man. I look back and the last, uh, six, now seven deer that I've shot have been the ninth through the 18th. Mm-hmm. And that is the sweet spot, man. I mean, and it's any deer, like, like a lot of the guys who have that named buck where they said, Oh yeah, I'm going after Claude Hopper. You know, that buck is probably not there now. Then that's, what's great about it. Usually the, the around that, that time around the 14th to the 21st, getting into Thanksgiving, that buck is, if he's not already been shot by that hunter is out and looking for more does that he hasn't already yeah. bred and, and exploring new turf. That's why I said most years I never I never have you know any photos of the deer I get because they're all just they're someone else's deer. <laughs> this right. was a buck someone else was after, and now he's on my property. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's what makes this all fun. Oh, um, yeah. But we're out of the race now. Going? No, I'm going to Oklahoma tomorrow. <laughs> uh, talking about not which I've got a giant in Oklahoma that I'm really trying to kill. Um, Where's that at again? Where where exactly? What's that? I'll you, drop you a pin. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which I, I said, I don't believe in science. Um, said that jokingly, but if you've listened to this podcast from the beginning, I've talked about peeing from your tree, how it not only doesn't hurt you, but it helps you. Um, I never know where you're going with the conversation. And every time <laughs> I'm getting there, <laughs> listen, I've always wanted to put it on a shirt, pee from your tree. And I just want like a silhouette of a dude in a tree saying you to see a stream coming out. Uh, always want great. To put you should shirt. definitely wear that to elementary school when you pick up your kids. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> especially the one my wife's a teacher at. That'd be good. Um, but I say I don't believe in science, but I've always said pee from your tree. Well, I had one of the nation's leading deer biologists on the podcast. And he said, yeah, there's absolutely no science behind what you're saying about peeing from your tree. Because before that, I had said like – I tried to be scientific with it and say like your pee is 90% ammonia anyways. And after X amount of time, it's a hundred percent ammonia. So all they smell is urine. They don't know what did it or who did it for all they know. It could have been another buck. So yeah, there's no science behind what you're saying. I'm like, yeah, but it works. So I'm going to keep doing it. So, so did he say, hold on. He said not to pee. No, he just said, you, yeah, pee from your tree, but there's okay. no science that it helps you. Good. But he Cause I, I do that routinely. I've, I've done worse than pee out of my tree. Well, what, yeah. Well, what, <laughs> I'll tell you what changed my mind on this is I used to be the whole carry a Gatorade bottle to your tree, pee oh. in it. Uh, I used to be that guy. And then I was hunting with Gabe. And for those of you, I mean, Gabe's a big buck killer, just always shooting big deer. And we're hunting and he just drops his drawers and pees in the blind. And I'm like, dude, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Like, you just screwed everything up. And he's like, shut up. You're one of those guys. And I'm like, yeah, here's my bottle. Finish off, you know? Anyways, he's like, dude, I pee from my tree as much as I can. Like, I drink a whole lot to pee more from my stand. Um, so yeah, my anyways, biggest buck I killed, I killed after peeing out of my tree. I, I think I'm going <laughs> to do one with one time it's still out. Like, I want to kill one with it out still. <laughs> um, anyways, oh, man. I have been very close to that once. I actually, you ever pheasant hunt before? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sure someone watching this has, like, I, uh, we walked an entire quarter acre coming back, not a single bird. I sling my shotgun to my shoulder, and it, I remember how cold specifically it was that day, cold fingers. Yeah. And um, holy cow, as soon as I started to go, oh, a like bird a flew up. That day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> as, soon, as soon as as I was able to go, that bird flew up from no less than six inches from where I was going, and I about fell into my own stream like it was i'll never Dude. forget that that was that uh, <laughs> it was on the wrong barrel so yeah one time me and my dad were hunting together and uh there was a buck coming in he was in the middle of peeing in a bottle that was before i learned all this stuff and he was peeing in a bottle and i said dad do get ready. There's a buck coming in. He's like, I can't. Got my wiener in my hand. <laughs> and I'm like, you gotta pinch that thing off, dude. He's like, dude, I'm old. I can't do that. And I'm like, dude, hurry up. This buck's like 40 yards. And I'm like, hurry up. That area. He was like, I'm trying. It was a big ordeal. We ended up shooting the buck. But um, anyways, I digress. I've never once had urine. And I don't want to disagree with a learned man of science. But my biggest buck, like I said, I shot right after peeing. And I peed down my tree because at the time I was like, well, maybe if I keep the scent like right here at the base. Yeah. Like 
I had my buck come in and fend off four other bucks. Like they were literally around me because he had a bedded doe close by. I had all these bucks everywhere around me, every single wind direction. None of them cared. Well, and that's no, no, no. He was not saying it does. It hurts. Uh, he was okay. saying there's no okay. scientific data that it helps. Um, but anyways, I was in Oklahoma hunting that giant 10, the one I showed you. And I said, yeah. I, I've got every night. And so I left to go to Oklahoma. And so I was hunting that night. He didn't show up. Um, but I had a decent little, probably two and a half year old, one ten, one fifteen 15 out. He came in and then he had worked out and I had to pee. So this deer is only 27 yards away at this point. And so I whip it out and I pee. And that deer had already come in and he left and I peed. And the sound of my pee brought him back. Brought him back. And I think the sound more than anything, yep. like they just hear something peeing over there. Yeah. Remy Warren actually talks about that. Uh, he he does that when he's in close quarters with bull elk. If Remy does anything, I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> well, he talks about sometimes, you know, when you're that close and you don't want to, you know, make them suspicious, they're call shy. He'll just do that on the ground and that works. So that's a, that's a actual tactic. I've never thought to use it on a whitetail though. Uh, I, yeah. I literally, I was like, I've never seen how they actually act when I pee. And so I whip it out, and as soon Are as I'm taking notes the whole time, yeah, oh, dude, I'm like, yes. I'm midstream taking notes. Um, but like, I, I literally, I'm watching him when I start peeing, and it hits the ground, and he just whips his head around, and he comes right back in, like, oh, maybe I missed something over there. And I was just like, okay, there is, like, I have at least prov proven to myself that, like, if a deer hears me peeing, he starts to come, like, so. Have you ever peed in your scrapes? Yes. Yeah. The so. science behind that is not that they smell your pee. But they just smell pee. No, but yes, but you're reactivating the scents that are in there. Oh, okay. Like because you're heating it up and adding <clears throat> liquid, like you're refreshing those scents. You could do the same if you took in boiling hot water and not boiling hot, but just hot water and poured it in there because you're just reactivating those scents mm -hmm. by, you know, adding life back to them almost. So... But yeah, science. Hunt over a decoy, pee from your tree, get out there and hunt. Thanks for listening. You guys have a great week. Guys, there's not many things that I'm going to tell you to stop and do right now. One of those things is to stop and go join Pope and Young right now. It's 45 bucks for the entire year to be a member of Pope and Young. And what that does for you is that helps to ensure your rights as a bow hunter. Pope and Young is constantly fighting for your rights as a bow hunter. They are the national bow hunting organization in North America. They exist to protect your rights as a bow hunter. They are all the time going before state legislators uh, to fight for your rights and to continue protecting your rights as a bow hunter. The record book exists in the first place because somewhere between us and the Indians, people had lost sight that bow hunting was a lethal way of harvesting big game. And so Glenn St. Charles and his group of cohorts, they started the record book so they could take it to different states and show that bow hunting is, in fact, a a ethical way of harvesting big game. So guys, don't get caught in, in, in Pope and Young only being a record book. They are your voice for bow hunters, and there's power in numbers. So I would highly encourage you to join today because we need to stand together to protect our rights. Also, what you might not know is if you've bought a bear bow, you can go and register that bow, and you're actually going to get a free Pope and Young membership. Bear Archery is such a believer in the mission of Pope and Young and what they stand for and what they do to protect our rights that they are going to buy your first year's membership. So if you've bought a bow, go online and register that bow, and you're going to get a free year's membership to Pope and Young. But guys, I would encourage you, stop right here right now and go join Pope and Young because we have to protect our rights as bow hunters. <laughs>